Thank you, Benji. Happy Lunar New Year. Hey. <laughs> so I have a joy, an unexpected joy to share, which I will do now. I was presented with the stole that I am wearing by the board, your board, and so I'm going to show it off very quickly. I had to wear it because, well, happy Lunar New Year. In April 1972, Mr. Rogers invited a special guest to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. The guest was astronaut Al Warden, and they talked about space travel, including the astronaut talking about the back side of the moon, which we never see from Earth. I'm sure it was just another beautiful day in the neighborhood. So in the last few weeks, many Asian countries have celebrated the new lunar year. A lunar calendar is one that is based on the cycles of the moon's phases. Now, a lunar year is about 354 days long. The moon's phases from new moon to full moon repeat approximately every 29.5 days, approximately. The lunar calendar is 11 days shorter than the solar candle calendar, the Gregorian calendar, which we use. It has 12 lunar months, but an extra month is added every two or three years to keep the calendar in sync with the solar year. The cycles of the moon have long been used as a way to measure time. Some cultures use a lunar calendar because its cycles have been used already for thousands of years to mark the passing of time. The moon is one of the most prominent and easily observable of, the, of our celestial bodies that we can see with the naked eye. Some cultures use lunar calendars because it's convenient and because of the accuracy, but also because of the connection to nature and agriculture, and sometimes religious significance and cultural significance that they've given for the moon. So the lunar year is more closely tied to the natural rhythms of the earth, such as the cycles of planting and harvesting crops. And so some religious communities synchronize their observances with the cycles of the moon. The ancient ancestors of Mexico were deeply connected to the movements of the moon. Four or so years ago, my spouse and I traveled to Mexico. I was a guest preacher at our congregation in San Miguel de Allende, and that is one lively congregation, and it's also one beautiful, lovely city. I invite you to go anytime. They are so welcoming and warm. So while we were there, we decided to go on a tour to Cañada de la Virgen, ruins that date back to 500 AD, when the Otomi people began to use the site. The ruins include the House of the 13 Heavens, House of the Longest Night, House of the Wind, and the Ceremonial Avenue. We also saw sunken patios and squares and a court for playing Mesoamerican ball game. The site was dedicated to the moon, Venus, and the sun. We were led by an archaeoastronomist, a scholar who studies the astronomical practices, the celestial stories, mythologies, religions, and worldviews of ancient cultures that are tied to our sky. He taught us that moonlight moves up the stairs of the pyramid ruins, Cañada de la Virgen, as it waxes and wanes, and shines through notches during specific times in the lunar calendar. Uh, I could imagine the bustling of children holding the hands of their parents as they walk down the ceremonial avenue. I imagine the, them being harried, planning a journey to Cañada de la Virgen to participate in rising moon rituals, having to gather together food, wondering where they would get fresh water, how they would keep track of their children, and planning to be blessed by being together with others just as we are when we have our, our flower communion or Christmas Eve. Ancient sites like Cañada de la Virgen remind us today that our experience of the world is ever evolving 
and that it is a shared experience. For ancients around the world, the moon was more than an object of beauty. It was seen as impacting daily life within a community, guiding activities like when to plant and when to worship. The moon was worthy of the creation of specific rituals honoring its impact, and buildings were erected in alignment with its pass across the heavens. Understanding the moon as a sacred object adds a new perspective to our appreciation for the moon beyond its beauty. Wilda Gaffney is a biblical scholar, Episcopalian minister, and African-American woman with both Christian and Jewish theological roots. She's also a professor. In her 2017 book, Womanist Midrash, a reintroduction to the women of the Torah and of the throne. She writes about the sanctified imagination of the black church. Dr. Gaffney describes sanctified imagination as the fertile creative space where the inter interpreter, like you and me, enters the text, particularly the spaces in the text, and fills them out with missing details kind of like I did when I was at Kenyan de la Virgin. The sacred imagination tells us the story behind the story, the story between the lines on the page. So guess what? This is what we do as Unitarian Universalists all the time. We take a story, a poem, prose from our hymnal, an event, a video, and from such content, place it in the context of our lives. Our imaginings about those texts become sacred imagination, enriching and animating our religious life together and our private spiritual lives. So I invite you now to participate in creating sacred imagination with a poem from Mary Oliver. Anybody like Mary Oliver? Yeah. Now, Mary Oliver is not a religious poet, right? She is not a theologian, but boy, we love us some Mary Oliver. So Mary Oliver was a queer white woman who won many awards for her poetry, including the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. So I invite you to settle in for a moment. I will read this twice, so feel free to close your eyes or soften your gaze, and just notice your response. The first reading, The Sweetness of Dogs. What do you say, Percy? I am thinking of sitting out on the sand to watch the moon rise. It's full tonight, so we go. And the moon rises so beautiful it makes me shudder, makes me think about time and space, makes me take measure of myself, one iota, pondering heaven. Thus we sit, myself, thinking how grateful I am for the moon's perfect beauty, and also, oh, how rich it is to love the world. Percy, meanwhile, leans against me and gazes up into my face as though I were just as wonderful as the perfect moon. And again, what do you say, Percy? I am thinking of sitting out on the sand to watch the moon rise. It's full tonight. So we go and the moon rises. So beautiful, it makes me shudder. Makes me think about time and space. Makes me take measure of myself, one iota, pondering heaven. Thus we sit, myself thinking how grateful I am for the moon's perfect 
beauty. And also, oh, how rich it is to love the world. Percy, meanwhile, leans against me and gazes up into my face as though I were just as wonderful as the perfect moon. So where did your sacred imagination take you in that beautiful poem? What did you see in your mind's eye? What feelings arose? Notice that you have not left this space. You are still here, still online. Whatever you felt, boredom, peace, love for your, furry fr for your own furry friend, was all created from the power of your mind. It could be that you imagined a cat instead of a dog or a person instead of a four-legged furry friend. It might be your heart was broken on a beach and you hadn't shaken off that connection. You may remember the incredible feeling of joy when you watched the sunset over the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Gulf of Mexico, the hills behind your home, the mountains you traveled to grandmothers. Mary Oliver's poem creates within us a feeling that is sacred. We can enter into the life shared with an adoring Percy. We can read within that story how four-legged friends like treats we offer like chicken off the bone and peanut butter that sticks to the top of their mouths and their gratitude when we take them to the vet as a puppy because wow, they thought that chocolate was delicious. <laughs> We imagine ourselves sitting in the sand, watching the sky turn from the orange of a setting sun over water, then slowly darkening and fading into a deep black before the rising full moon once again lights up the water lapping at the shore. We can feel the sand conforming to the shape of our buns. We might smell slightly damp dog because maybe there was mist from the ocean settling into the fur of Percy, and Percy experienced the beach as well. His presence changed Mary Oliver's real or imagined experience that she wrote about, just as we all change one another's experiences. Consider the last two stanzas of another beloved Mary Oliver poem, Wild Geese number 490 in our hymnal. Notice how it invites us into sacred imagination, these last two stanzas. The wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Oliver's poems call us into considering who we are through the lens of our sacred imagination. Your experiences enliven the poem. Your imagination enlivens her poems. So who are you? Who you are matters. Who you are matters to all of us because who you are is a part of who we are. How will we create a world where someone who rolls down the sidewalk finds a community as welcome as someone who walks? How will we create a world where we will not tolerate violence and we will move heaven and earth to stop it if we do not imagine that world? and see it as sacred. Now do not lose heart with the world as it is. Keep imagining that better world. And if you can, act. Go to ASU administration and tell them, hey, that's not right. Pray, meditate, write. Go to a rally, protest, share 
your heart with friends, support with your wallet, draw, create a tat, wear a t-shirt with your message emblazoned, I will not stand for the way the world is. I imagine a world of love. I imagine a world of beloved community. I can see it so clearly and it's so sacred that I can taste it. Sing, paint, volunteer, use ritual like the Otomi did with their uh, moon. Use your mind, just use your mind to keep learning. Become wiser. Activate your sacred imagination. Help create and celebrate what is worthy and holy. Who you are and who you imagine and what you imagine matters. So India Ri shared who she is in the song we sang, I Am Light. If you are not just the color of your eyes, if you are not just the color of your skin, if you are not just the mistakes you've made, who are you? What is sacred in this world to you? Mr. Rogers knew the power of sacred imagination. <laughs> he sang about it five out of seven days, inviting children into imagining with him a world of radical inclusion and belonging. Countless children heard, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Who do you imagine that you would sing to? Who are you?